distinguished American amongst us today that I think it'd be nice if we could hear a few words from him. Beardsley Rummel, who I know needs no introduction. You know, there's many interests, civic and government. You're all living by his tax plan. I don't know if that was good or bad. <laughs> Maybe he has an idea how we can reduce taxes. I don't know. You can't tell. But we'd love to hear from B. Where is he? Over here. Come on, B. <laughs> tell us how we can make more money and pay no taxes. Mr. Taxpayer, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I think it's very gratifying at a meeting such as this to hear as little discussion as there is to prove that it is economically possible and desirable to employ the disabled citizen. We don't want to forget it. We can't say that it is overemphasized. By that I mean the economics. But there are other elements that transcend the economics that, if you please, give it the flavor that makes the economic worth doing. So I'm not going to talk much about the economic. I'm going to talk about some other aspects. We've gone a long way from 20 years ago when if one man had a job, he was keeping somebody else from having a job. Do you remember when a wife couldn't get a job in the federal government because her husband was employed? And do you remember that even now, we think that anyone who's getting old age security probably ought to quit work because they're keeping somebody else from work. We still have some hangovers from the period of share the work. And these are disappearing rapidly. And today, I think no one feels that a disabled employee is keeping anyone else from a job. I mention this only to show how far we have progressed, and yet how much farther we must progress. As far as the other responsibilities, there's only one word for it, and these are the moral responsibilities, the duty that arises from people who are in positions of power. The economic having been settled abundantly. The company that does not organize to do what it can to employ the disabled. The management must be considered either ignorant or indifferent. And from neither point of view does that make an acceptable basis for a company that has to work in the kind of society we are. Because people expect people in the position of power to exercise their moral duty with respect to the people that work with them and the community in which they live. Now there's a curious thing about work, and that is that work is not only a way of making a living, but it's a way of living. The human animal was born to work. We all have a little touch in our human nature of the squirrel and of the beaver. The squirrel who puts away more nuts than he can possibly eat and the beaver that makes more dams than he can possibly use. We all have this in us. And the individual without work, by and large, is an individual who is outside of himself as a normal, psychological, biological human being. And so in addition to performing all the other functions and all the economic benefits that arise from this measure of employment. There is the additional value that comes from making normal, sane human beings out of people who otherwise might feel unlocated, if you please, in the society in which they're living. So I present this to you as a problem for business, not so much to find a profitable way of using people but to find the way of organizing your organization so that this work will be done. Now, there are some who feel, I think, that there's a public relations factor that is a negative one. 
but I can assure you that it is again up to business to help with the public opinion that will not only make the visible signs of employment of the disabled uh, not unpleasant, but pleasant. Yesterday afternoon, I was sitting in the lobby of the Waldorf, and I saw a porter going around picking up ashes and paper, who was obviously a man with serious physical handicap. I don't think it was only the fact that I was coming here today that makes me feel even better about the Waldorf. And I think that you will get, with the effort that is going on from this group, a feeling on the part of the public of expecting to see in positions that can be appropriately arranged for them the employment of the disabled. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, we are open today for the Bar Association. I have Mr. Beardsley Rummel, Chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Uh, Mr. Rummel uh, is a statistician, an economist, a philanthropist, a planner, and a businessman, indeed a manner of affairs. He was born in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. His father was Wenzel Rummel, who was a county doctor, and his mother, uh, Salomon uh, Beardsley Rummel was a hospital superintendent. He received a BA from Dartmouth College in 1915, a PhD in psychology and education from the University of Chicago in 1917, and he's married uh, with three children. His pioneering work in statistics uh, helped design the aptitude and intelligence tests for the US Army. Um, and he went on uh, to direct the fellowship program at the Laura Spellman Rockefeller Memorial Fund, uh, supporting uh, work focusing on behavioural science. He has been an advisor to President Herbert Hoover, uh, especially on farm issues, became Dean of the Division of Social Sciences at the University of Chicago, and uh, the Centre for Quantitative Research. He was appointed Director of the New York Federal Reserve Bank uh, from 1937 onwards um, and uh, created Chairman in 1941 um, and was active in the Bretton Woods Conference in 1944 in which the monetary system, uh, new monetary system, was established. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to Mr. Rummel, and I'm sure you'll all be interested in what you have to say. Good afternoon, gentlemen. The superior position of public government over private business is nowhere more clearly evident than in government's power to tax business. Business gets its many rulemaking powers from public government. Public government sets the limits to the exercise of these rulemaking powers of business and protects the freedom of business operations within this area of authority. Taxation is one of the limitations placed by government on the power of business to do what it pleases. There is nothing reprehensible about this procedure. The business that is taxed is not a creature of flesh and blood. It is not a citizen. It has no voice in how it shall be governed, nor should it. The issues in the taxation of business are not moral issues, but are questions of practical effect. What will get the best results? How should business be taxed so that business will make its greatest contribution to the common good? It is sometimes instructive when faced with alternatives to ask the underlying question. If we are to understand the problem involved in the taxation of business, we must first ask, why does government need to tax at all? This seems to be a simple question. But as is the case with simple questions, 
the obvious answer is likely to be a superficial one. The obvious answer is, of course, that taxes provide the revenue which the government needs in order to pay its bills. It happened if we look at the financial history of recent years, it is apparent that nations have been able to pay their bills even though their tax revenues fell short of expenses. These countries, whose expenses were greater than their receipts from taxes, paid their bills by borrowing the necessary money. The borrowing of money, therefore, is an alternative which governments use to supplement the revenues from taxation in order to obtain the necessary means for the payment of their bills. A government which depends on loans and on the refunding of its loans to get the money it requires for its operations is necessarily dependent on the sources from which the money can be obtained. In the past, if a government persisted in borrowing heavily to cover its expenditures, interest rates would get higher and higher, and greater and greater inducements would have to be offered by the government to the lenders. These governments finally found that the only way they could maintain both their sovereign independence and their solvency was to tax heavily enough to meet a substantial part of their financial needs, and to be prepared, if placed under undue pressure, to tax to meet them all. The necessity for a government to tax in order to maintain both its independence and its solvency is true for state and local governments, but it is not true for a national government. Two changes of the greatest consequence have occurred in the last 25 years which have substantially altered the position of the national state with respect to the financing of its current requirements. The first of these changes is the gaining of vast new experience in the management of central banks. The second change is the elimination, for domestic purposes, of the convertibility of the currency into gold. Free of the money market. Final freedom from the domestic money market exists for every sovereign national state when there exists an institution which functions in the manner of a modern central bank, and whose currency is not convertible into gold or into some other commodity. The United States is a national state which has a central banking system, the Federal Reserve System, and whose currency for domestic purposes is not convertible into any commodity. It follows that our federal government has final freedom from the money market in meeting its financial requirements. Accordingly, the inevitable social and economic consequences of any and all taxes have now become the prime consideration in the imposition of taxes. In general, it may be said that since all taxes have consequences of a social and economic character, the government should look to these consequences in formulating its tax policy. All federal taxes must meet the test of public policy and practical effect. The public purpose which is served should never be obscured in a tax programme under the mask of raising revenue. What taxes are really for? Federal taxes can be made to serve four principal purposes of a social and economic character. These purposes are 1. As an instrument of fiscal policy to help stabilise the purchasing power of the dollar. 2. To express public policy in the distribution of wealth and of income as in the case of the progressive income and estate taxes. Three to express public policy in subsidising or in penalising various industries and economic groups. Four, to isolate and assess directly the costs of certain national benefits, such as highways and social security. In the recent past, we have used our federal tax programme consciously for each of these purposes. In serving these purposes, the tax programme is a means to an end. The purposes themselves are matters of basic national policy, which should be established, in the first instance, 
independently of any national tax programme. Among the policy questions which we have to deal with are these. Do we want a dollar with reasonably stable purchasing power over the years? Do we want greater equality of wealth and of income than would result from economic forces working alone? Do we want to subsidise certain industries and certain economic groups? Do we want the beneficiaries of certain federal activities to be aware of what they cost? These questions are not tax questions, they are questions as to the kind of country we want and the kind of life we want to lead. The tax programme should be a means to an agreed end. The tax programme should be devised as an instrument and it should be judged by how well it serves its purpose. By all odds, the most important single purpose to be served by the imposition of federal taxes is the maintenance of a dollar which has stable purchasing power over the years. Sometimes this purpose is stated as the avoidance of inflation and without the use of federal taxation all other means of stabilisation such as monetary policy and price controls and subsidies are unavailing. All other means, in any case, must be integrated with federal tax policy if we are to have tomorrow a dollar which has a value near to what it has today. The war has taught the government, and the government has taught the people, that federal taxation has much to do with inflation and deflation, with the prices which have to be paid for the things that are bought and sold. If federal taxes are insufficient or the wrong kind, the purchasing power in the hands of the public is likely to be greater than the output of goods and services, with which this de purchasing demand can be satisfied. If the demand becomes too great, the result will be a rise in prices and there will be no proportionate increase in the quantity of things for sale. This will mean that the dollar is worth less than it was before, that is, inflation. On the other hand, if federal taxes are too heavy or are of the wrong kind, effective purchasing power in the hands of the public will be insufficient to take from the producers of goods and services all the things these producers would like to make. This will mean widespread unemployment. The dollars the government spends become purchasing power in the hands of the people who have received them. The dollars the government takes by taxes cannot be spent by the people and therefore these dollars can no longer be used to acquire the things which are available for sale. Taxation is therefore an instrument of the first importance in the administration of any fiscal and monetary policy. To distribute wealth. The second principal purpose of federal taxes is to attain more equality of wealth and of income than would result from economic forces working alone. The taxes which are effective for this purpose are the progressive individual income tax, the progressive estate tax and the gift tax. What these taxes should be depends on public policy with respect to the distribution of wealth and of income. It is important here to note that the estate and gift taxes have little or no significance as tax measures for stabilising the value of the dollar. Their purpose is the social purpose of preventing what otherwise would be high concentration of wealth and income at a few points as a result of investment and reinvestment of income not expended in meeting day-to-day -day consumption requirements. These taxes should be defended and attacked in terms of their effects on the character of American life, not as revenue measures. The third reason for federal taxes is to provide a subsidy for some industrial or economic interest. The most conspicuous example of these taxes is the tariffs on imports. Originally taxes of this type were imposed to serve a double purpose. Since a century and a half ago, 
the national government required revenues in order to pay its bills. Today, tariffs on imports are no longer needed for revenue. These taxes are nothing more than devices to provide subsidies to selected industries. Their social purpose is to provide a price floor above which a domestic industry can compete with goods which can be produced abroad and sold in this country more cheaply, except for the tariff protection. The subsidy is paid not at the port of entry where the imported goods are taxed, but in the higher price level for all goods of the same type produced and sold at home. The fourth purpose served by federal taxes is to access directly and visibly the costs of certain benefits. Such taxation is highly desirable in order to limit the benefits to amounts which the people who benefit are willing to pay. The most conspicuous examples of such measures are the social security benefits, old age and unemployment insurance. The social purposes of giving such benefits and of assessing specific taxes to meet the costs are obvious. Unfortunately and unnecessarily, in both cases, the programmes have involved staggering deflationary consequences as a result of the excess of current receipts over current disbursements. The bad tax. The federal tax on corporation profits is the tax which is most important in its effect on business operations. There are other taxes which are of great concern to special classes of business. There are many problems of state and local taxation of business which become extremely urgent, particularly when a corporation has no profits at all. However, we shall confine our discussion to the federal corporation income tax since it is in this way that business is principally taxed. We shall also confine our considerations to the problems of ordinary peacetime taxation, since during wartime many tax measures, such as the excess profits tax, have a special justification. Taxes on corporation profits have three principal consequences, all of them bad. Briefly, the three bad effects of the corporation income tax are 1. The money which is taken from the corporation in taxes must come in one of three ways. It must come from the people, in the higher prices they pay for the things they buy, from the corporation's own employees in wages that are lower than they otherwise would be, or from the corporation's stockholders in a lower rate of return on their investment. No matter from which source it comes or in what proportion, this tax is harmful to production to purchasing power and to investment. 2. The tax on corporation profits is a distorting factor in managerial judgment, a factor which is prejudicial to clear engineering and economic analysis of what will be best for the production and distribution of things for use, and the larger the tax, the greater the distortion. 3. The corporation income tax is the cause of double taxation, the individual taxpayer is taxed once when his profit is earned by the corporation and once again when he receives the profit as a dividend. This double taxation makes it more difficult to get people to invest their savings in business than if the profits of business are only taxed once. Furthermore, stockholders with small incomes bear as heavy a burden under the corporation income tax as do stockholders with large incomes. Analysis. Let us examine these three bad effects of the tax on corporation profits more closely. The first effect we observed was that the corporation income tax results in either higher prices, lower wages, reduced return on investment, or all three in combination. When the corporation income tax was first imposed, it may have been believed by some that an in personal levy could be placed on the profits of a soulless corporation, a levy which would be neither a sales tax, a tax on wages or a double tax on the stockholder. Obviously this is impossible in any real sense. A corporation is nothing but a method of doing business which is embodied in words inscribed on a piece of paper. The tax must be paid by one or more of the people who are parties 
at interest in the business, either as customer, as employee or as stockholder. It is impossible to know exactly who pays how much of the tax on corporation profits. The stockholder pays some of it to the extent that the return on his investment is less than it would be if there were no tax, but it is equally certain that the stockholder does not pay all of the tax on corporate income. Indeed, he may pay very little of it. After a period of time, the corporation income tax is figured as one of the costs of production and it gets passed on in higher prices charged for the company's goods and services and in lower wages, including conditions of work which are inferior to what they otherwise might be. The reasons why the corporation income tax is passed on, in some measure, must be clearly understood. In the operations of a company, that management of the business, directed by the profit motive, keeps its eyes on what is left over as profit for the stockholders. Since the corporation must pay its federal income taxes before it can pay dividends, the taxes are thought of the same way as any other uncontrollable expense, as an outlay to be covered by higher prices or lower costs, of which the principal cost is wages. Since all competition in the same line of business is thinking the same way, prices and costs will tend to stabilise at a point which will produce a profit after taxes, sufficient to give the industry access to new capital at a reasonable price. When this finally happens, as it must, if the industry is to hold its own, the federal income tax on corporations will have been largely absorbed in higher prices and in lower wages. The effect of the corporation income tax is therefore to raise prices blindly and to lower wages by an indeterminable amount. Both tendencies are in the wrong direction and are harmful to the public welfare. Where would the money go? Suppose the corporation income tax were removed where would the money go that is now paid in taxes? That depends. If the industry is highly competitive, as is the case with retailing, a large share would go in lower prices, and a smaller share would go in higher wages and in higher yield on savings invested in the industry. If labour in the industry is strongly organised, as in the railroad, steel and automotive industries, the share going in higher wages would tend to increase. If the industry is neither competitive, nor organised, nor regulated, of which industries there are very few, a large share would go to the stockholders. In so far as the elimination of the present corporation income tax would result in lower prices, it would raise the standard of living for everyone. The second bad effect of the corporation income tax is that it is a distorting factor in management judgment, entering into every decision and causing actions to be taken which would not have been taken on business grounds alone. The tax consequences of every important commitment have to be appraised. Sometimes some action which ought to be taken cannot be taken because the tax results make the transaction valueless or worse. Sometimes apparently census actions are fully warranted because of tax benefits. The results of this tax thinking is to destroy the integrity of business judgment and to set up a business structure and tradition which does not hang together in terms of the compulsion of inner economic or engineering efficiency. Premium on debt. The most conspicuous illustration of the bad effect of the tax consideration on business judgment is seen in the preferred position that debt financing has over equity financing. This preferred position is due to the fact that interest and rents paid on capital used in a business are deductible as expense, whereas dividends paid are not. The result weighs the scales always in favour of debt financing since no income tax is paid on the deductible costs of this form of capital. This tendency goes on, although it is universally agreed that business and the country generally would be in a stronger position if a much larger proportion of all investment 
were in common stocks and equities and a smaller proportion in mortgages and bonds. It must be conceded that in many cases a high corporation income tax induces management to make expenditures which prudent judgment would avoid. This is particularly true if a long-term benefit may result, a benefit which cannot or need not be capitalised. The long-term expense is shared involuntarily by government with business and under these circumstances a long chance is often well worth taking. Scientific research and institutional advertising are favourite vehicles for the use of these cheap dollars. Since these expenses reduce profits, they reduce taxes at the same time and the cost to the business is only the margin of the expenditure that would have remained after the taxes had been paid. The government pays the rest. Admitting that a certain amount of venturesome expenditure does result from this tax inducement, it is an unhealthy form of unregulated subsidy which in the end will soften the fibre of management and will result in excess timidity when the risk must be carried by the business alone. The third unfortunate consequence of the corporation income tax is that the same earnings are taxed twice, once when they are earned and once when they are distributed. This double taxation causes the original profit margin to carry a tremendous burden of tax making it difficult to justify equity investment in a new and growing business. It also works contrary to the principles of the progressive income tax, since the small stockholder with a small income pays the same rate of corporation tax on his share of the earnings as does the stockholder whose total income falls in the highest brackets. This defect of double taxation is serious, both as it affects equity in the total tax structure and as a handicap to the investment of savings in business. Shortly an evil. Any one of these three bad effects of the corporation income tax would be enough to put it severely on the defensive. The three effects taken together make an overwhelming case against this tax. The corporation income tax is an evil tax and it should be abolished. The corporation income tax cannot be abolished until some method is found to keep the corporate form from being used as a refuge from the individual income tax and as a means of accumulating an unneeded, uninvested surpluses. Some way must be devised whereby the corporation earnings, which inure to the individual stockholders, are adequately taxed as income of these individuals. The weaknesses and dangers of the corporation income tax have been known for years and an ill-fated attempt to abolish it was made in 1936 in a proposed undistributed profits tax. This tax, as it was imposed by Congress, had four weaknesses which soon drove it from the books. First, the income tax on corporations was not eliminated in the final legislation, but the undistributed profits tax was added on top of it. Second, it was never made absolutely clear by regulation or by statute just what form of distributed capitalisation of withheld and reinvested earnings would be taxable to the stockholders and not to the corporation. Third, the Securities and Exchange Commission did not set forth special and simple regulations covering securities issued to capitalise withheld earnings. Fourth, the earnings of a corporation were frozen to a particular fiscal year, with none of the flexibility of the carry-forward, carry-back provisions of the present law. Granted that the corporation income tax must, be, must go, it will not be easy to devise protective measures which will be entirely satisfactory. The difficulties are not merely difficulties of technique and of avoiding the pitfalls of a perfect solution, impossible to administer, but are questions of principle that raise issues as to the proper locus of power over new capital investment. Can the government afford to give up the corporation income tax? This really is not the question. The question is this. Is it a favourable way of assessing taxes on the people, on the consumer, the workers and investors? 
who after all are the only real taxpayers. It is clear from any point of view that the effects of the corporation income tax are bad effects. The public purposes to be served by taxation are not thereby well served. The tax is uncertain in its effect with respect to the stabilisation of the dollar and it is inequitable as parts of a progressive levy on individual income. It tends to raise the price of goods and services. It tends to keep wages lower than they otherwise might be. It reduces the yield on investment and obstructs the flow of savings into business enterprise. I thank you, gentlemen, and uh, after a short break, I'm happy to take some questions from the floor. Yeah, I've been looking this morning at um, paying for promises and the UK election 2017. I've done a few blogs which um, cover aspects of money creation. Um, and I just wanted to play these two BBC reality check uh, videos, which um, I'll then analyse uh, with respect to the notions they have of taxation, what taxation is for, and how taxation um, is conflated with government spending and uh, the budget deficit um, and the national debt. Uh, the deficit and the national debt being two rather different things, uh, but also um, the idea that if the government doesn't raise enough in taxes that somehow that means it falls short um, uh, with balancing its budget, um, that is a notion that really needs to be challenged. Margaret Thatcher famously, uh, when she came to power in 1979 waving her handbag, um, was very keen to compare government economy, political economy, with that of household economy. And um, that's a fundamental mistake in categories with respect to uh, resources. Um, and the government, by uh, being the guarantor of last resort for um, people who are circulating IOUs, including banks and um, yeah, other commercial paper, so things like um, corporate bonds and um, other financial aggregation schemes, I guess we could call them. Um, it's a very important distinction. And um, so when the Conservative Party says that they are to be trusted with the economy and that it is only them that really understands the ideas of prudence, balancing the budget and uh, um, so forth, uh, that is actually, um, number one, uh, a claim that's based on a misunderstanding of how political economy um, and government financing indeed large corporate financing uh, ultimately works and um, as well as that it's a misunderstanding of what taxation actually does um, this is something that's been known uh, as long as ago as there was a chap called Rummel back in the 1930s Rummel that is he was a, a Federal Reserve um, Bank chairman and he wrote a paper back then uh, talking about how taxation has got nothing to do with government spending in that what it's really for is controlling agricultural demand in the economy and um, making sure that you don't have uh, that classic old saying of too much money chasing too few goods. Um, so anyway, let's just play these and um, get a bit of context. 
so after weeks of hearing about strong and stable leadership, we finally got some details to look at. but unlike labour and the liberal democrats the conservatives haven't so far released their overall costings in a single table, so we're still working on those. there are some headline numbers though the tories now say they plan to balance the budget a little later by twenty twenty five and they say they plan to increase nhs spending by a minimum of eight billion in real terms over the next five years. so let's just look at a few more specific policies. the social care changes we've already heard about will mean tens of thousands more families have to pay for social care provided at home. but everyone will retain at least one hundred thousand pounds of their savings and assets including value in the family home. it's a policy designed to take account of the fact that we are living longer. the conservatives also want to raise money by means testing the winter fuel allowance ensuring that payments go only to the least wealthy pensioners. the scheme costs about three billion pounds a year at the moment means testing it could save about half of that. one revenue raising measure that both labour and the Lib Dems have promised of course is an increase in income tax not the Tories. if you look at this manifesto whilst there isn't a pro there isn't an absolute promise not to increase income tax and national insurance and so on what you've got here is a pretty modest set of proposals which probably aren't going to require terribly much in the way of tax increases one big conservative promise in the Cameron years was the triple lock on pensions under which the state pension rises by the rate of inflation, average earnings or 2.5%, whichever is the highest. Theresa May wants to scrap that, losing the 2.5% guarantee. That would give the government more flexibility, but it's impossible to say how much money it might save. Moving to education, the Conservatives want to boost school funding by £4 billion over the course of the next Parliament. One of the ways they plan to raise that money is to scrap universal free school lunches for infants, replacing them with much cheaper free school breakfasts in primary schools. But again, the manifesto contains no precise costing for this. Immigration policy also looms large in Conservative plans. They plan to double from £1,000 to £2,000 the amount companies have to pay to import highly skilled workers from outside the EU. We don't really know how much that might raise. The Conservatives have also reaffirmed their target of cutting overall net migration to less than 100,000 per year. But there will be a cost involved. The Independent Office for Budget Responsibility has estimated that it could, could cost £5.9 billion to cut annual net migration from about 273,000 now to 185,000 by 2021. That's because of things like a lower tax take and a higher proportion of non-working people in the overall population. And that's still a long way short of the 100,000 target. So it's something that will have to be taken into account in the debate to come. And the emphasis on immigration is a reminder that this is an election taking place in the shadow of the looming Brexit negotiations. The negotiations we're about to begin with the European Union won't be easy. They'll be challenging. At times, they will be tough. In Theresa May, Britain has a Prime Minister with the strength to lead Britain through these negotiations and make a success of the future. But the outcome of those negotiations over the next two years is deeply uncertain at the moment. The manifesto reasserts that the Conservatives think no deal with the EU is better than a bad deal. So the EU negotiations will probably do more than anything else in the next Parliament to determine the health of the British economy and the chances for any political party to put their promises into practice. So that was the Conservative reality check, um, the so-called reality check, and here is the uh, so-called Labour manifesto. Uh, than it is today. Check. It's finally been published officially and we've been crunching through the numbers here. So where does Labour say the money is coming from? Well, it estimates an extra tax take of £48.6 billion. Let's break that down a little. Income tax first. Higher earners will pay more. And we're talking about roughly the top 4 to 5% of earners. We reckon that's about 1.2 million people. Earnings above £80,000 will be taxed at 45%, with a new 50% rate on earnings above 123,000. 
Labour says this will raise 6.4 billion per year. But the biggest increase in tax take, according to Labour's plans, will come from an increase in corporation tax, a tax on business profits. It's currently 19%, and Labour plans to increase that rate to 26% by 2021. Once that's done, Labour says its corporation tax plans will raise an extra 19.4 billion per year. One really important thing, though, that Labour itself acknowledges is that companies and individuals change their behaviour when tax rates change. And you also have to take account the health of the overall economy. So raising tax rates doesn't always increase the overall tax take as much as predicted. There are other measures to raise revenue. For example, a levy on what Labour calls excessive pay, starting with a 2.5% levy paid by employers on pay packages over £330,000. There's also VAT on private school fees. Then the manifesto says £6.5 billion will be raised from an aggressive programme to crack down on tax avoidance. Now, political parties always say they'll do that, and it can be done, but it's a pretty inexact science. Overall, though, Labour says it can finance all its current spending plans through changes in the tax system. 48.6 billion out, 48.6 billion in. So does that add up? And they're suggesting a £50 billion pound increase in tax, which if it were to be implemented, by the way, would take the tax burden of this country to the highest level it's been in about 70 years. Uh, but, actually, I think there's an awful lot of uncertainty about whether you could actually raise that amount of tax. They're talking about very, very large increases in taxes on companies, which would likely reduce the amount of investment that they do. So I think the actual amount you could get from these policies certainly runs into the tens of billions, but probably doesn't reach the 50 billion that Labour are claiming. So that's tax, but there are also big plans for investment spending, all those nationalisation plans you've heard about, water companies, the Royal Mail and so on. Labour says it will borrow money to pay for future investment. It's talking about a national transformation fund of £250 billion, but there's no detailed costing of those nationalisation plans in the manifesto. That will be the source of controversy and political debate, but Labour does make one bold promise. It says it's committed to ensuring that the national debt is lower at the end of the next Parliament than it is today. So there you have it. Um, it's fine. I'm going to see if I can get hold of a transcript of both of those. Um, if not, I'll just uh, create one and um, then look at some of the assumptions which underlie some of those statements, such as the two hundred and fifty million pound National Investment Bank. Um, if a government wants to, outside of the EU, the European Union, have a national investment bank and, then, and has its own currency, there's nothing to stop it um, just spending that money into existence through the bank. Now, um, the question then becomes, uh, how much money is required in the economy to be circulating to make sure that what is produced and is capable of being produced as a uh, something that satisfies a demand or le legitimate demand um, and uh, so you can run into questions um, of putting too much money into an economy. Um, that is not a problem which has faced the world um, certainly since 2008. There are various reasons for that um, which boil down really to the fact that we've been in a debt deflation. Most of the money created is created by banks uh, who then lend the money to a very narrow section of the economy that, um, for speculative bubbles including property and enough money isn't actually getting into the productive section of the economy. Um, the banks uh, say they don't have enough people in the real economy that are credit worthy enough for them to deign to lend their money to. Um, 
bearing in mind that what they're doing is actually underwriting the credit of the individual borrowing the money. The bank doesn't actually have money from someone else that it's uh, providing a vetting exercise on behalf of to vet the borrower. They are making their own bets on the credit worthy of those people and um, effectively uh, substituting their own credit and in turn the government's credit for making that money um, available. Now um, that's privatisation of money creation and um, uh, there's lots of talk about the government or if Labour get in or nationalising railways, uh, nationalising the power grid and again the gentleman says that these aren't costed things. Um, this begs the question of why is it any be better for a um, foreign government or some individual billionaire who may or may not be from Britain or one of the other countries, why is it any better for them to own uh, something which they buy with debt as well than for the government to create its own debt and do that as well? Um, and to keep money circulate, to keep to keep the money from the profits from those industries, to invest in them, to keep them to a, a level that they assist everybody else and make life better and more efficient for those engaging in business and trade and manufacturing. Um, and so many of these things ultimately are circular arguments. Uh, once you agree the basis on which you're going to proceed but there's the important point to remember is that there's nothing cast in stone to say that the way that it is done at the moment and the way that it has been done um, since what they called big bang in the early 1980s which was the deregulation of the finance sector which effectively meant the privatization of the creation of debt-based money by banks rather than having it's subject to more control of the government and that's an ideological um, question. Now I know public administrators and I know very many businessmen and um, I know people on both sides of the fence who are head and shoulders above um, other people who are also on other sides of the fence in terms of uh, you know, leadership qualities, um, ensuring an efficient running of a, you know, of a team or a, a business enterprise or indeed a, a public service. So the question um, really boils down to this ideological thing that says that always if there is competition and it's in the free market or the private sector then it is going to be better if you think about it that just doesn't make sense there's there's no reason why that should be um, and if you believe that some individuals act in the interests of the greater good rather than their own personal interests um, I mean, I'm not one of those people, I must freely admit it, but I, I have seen people who I admire great, greatly who are like that, and one of whom seems to be Jeremy Corbyn. If, if you saw the interview with him on ITV in the leaders' interviews when he's asked about his uh, not insubstantial salary, um, which uh, the leader of the opposition and of the Labour Party and an MP combined is, you know, upwards of a hundred thousand pounds a year, um, and in his modesty, um, he, he simply would not allow himself to to say, uh, which was obvious to anyone watching it from his discomfort, that he obviously donates a substantial amount of his salary to good causes and charities, which. which um, uh, and, 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 and lives well within his means if he used all of that money for his own personal ends. Now, 
I mean, some people may think that makes him an idiot. Personally, I think it just makes him a virtuous person. So, um, uh, uh, and when we don't find virtue within ourselves, and, you know, I must confess, I'm, I'm a far from virtuous person. Um, but when I see it in someone else, it doesn't provoke ridicule in me. It, it provokes admiration and not not a little degree of of, of, of jealousy at the, the peace of mind that that can actually bring so that's really um, what I'm trying to get at uh, with 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 this is that the money system is not as the political analysis implies um, and the realities of government finance um, within the constraints of the EU it's quite true there are rules if you want to remain in the EU which preclude you from um, having states being involved investing in or saving certain industries now, and they call that protectionism now that's enshrined in the European Union and it's enshrined in the tenets of, of the European Central Bank uh, and the Commission um, administer all that side of you uh, as a competency which is not subject to the tenets of subsidiarity and that happens to be a fact um, so uh, there will be trade deals within which Britain um, are likely to become involved where uh, competition clauses may prevent them from doing what they need to do but um, they are choices political choices and not economic economic facts or facts of natural economics I mean economics is not a natural science anyway uh, it's all uh, built up out of human laws, human constructs, um, and Aristotle said it himself that money is not of nature; it's 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 a creature of laws, um, and uh, that was several thousand years ago, and it was right then, and it's right now. So uh, anyway, uh, that's that's me on that for now. Okay, having edited all of that now, um, I'm going to leave uh, what I said earlier after watching the fact-checking BBC videos, and all I wanted to do was add in some information, um, which I'll just sort of speak to briefly uh, here now then. It starts around here, I think. Yeah, here we are. Here's uh, this chap here is Professor L. Randall Ray, and he is uh, one of the main people involved in a, a academic movement school of thought called Modern Monetary Theory. Um, what that does is describes how the financial system works, which is pretty much as Beardsley Rummel. Um, said that's what this video here is. I'll put the link in the description. Um, now, this is the publication of the Rummel speech. It appeared in American Affairs, which is a quarterly journal, in January 1946. That's uh, what I read out to make it sort of interesting. There, there's the Beardsley Rummel Wikipedia article, which is very, very short. Um, and uh, here is a write-up about him on the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, who else have we got here now? Um, right, now this paper here is a paper written by uh, L. Randall Ray about monetary history because it's not only how the economic system works, it's the fundamental idea of what money is, how money started to be used um, and uh, I read this paper when it was first released and it's excellent um, it's great 
reading actually ahead of say reading something like David Graeber's Debt the First 5,000 Years or if you really want to get deep into it uh, Stephen Zarlinger's um, The Lost Science of Money. Now after Zarlinger you can actually go back further to uh, Del Mar who was re writing in the late 1800s um, and uh, I've been reading all of his work over the last few weeks and uh, I read it before and it really is very interesting stuff They're all available on uh, Project Guckenberg um, now what else have we got here that's um open here uh, right okay now the very start of this video starts with a section of Bursley Rummel actually speaking. I'd always wanted to hear him speaking. I wondered if I could find uh, uh, something that he says. And it was interesting, ahead of my recitation of his um, uh, The Real Purpose of Taxes article, um, it's from 1955. He died in 1960. Um, and you hear him talking about... Uh, employing physically handicapped people in a uh, economy at now at full employment but you get some sense from that of the man himself and his approach to political economy um, and uh, it's a classical um, ap approach um, a classical moral uh, ap approach I would say not like a classical liberal pro approach but a, a, a approach based on um, economics and commerce um, uh, for the community good uh, and I mean, he's no sort of um, died in the wool commie or something like that um, although there were people in the 1930s that felt that Roosevelt and Hoover were sort of leading the USA into communism um, that's how the John Birch Society was uh, brought into being um, and uh, I, mean, I do personally listen to the alt-right and listen to um, various commentators um, I've commented on my blog recently I've had a recent film which uh, James Dellingpole who uh, is the Breitbart editor for Breitbart London um, and I'd be interested to know what Mr Dellingpole makes of the Beersley Rummel um, speech. There's a bit of a um, discussion between MMT theorists and Austrian theorists regarding money um, and uh, there's lots of debates online between the two. There are also gold bugs etc who argue about gold as the only money um, you'll find actually uh, an old recording of William Jennings Bryan his uh, cross of gold speech um, uh, I have no objections to a bimetallic uh, metric for money um, but um, I also agree with Stephen Zarlinger that um, there hasn't actually ever been something which is a gold standard where the gold is the money it's always been uh, geared up if you like and therefore there's always been a fractional reserve element to uh, banking either under, under that standard although it provides a um, so uh, on that there's another gentleman you might want to look at his work Bernard Latier and Bernard suggests a basket of goods including gold and silver um, for a uh, currency for international trade uh, and suggests other currencies on a nation or even regional basis uh, for uh, trade in local areas. I'm a, actually a big fan of Leitier's work um, and then the part of this rabbit hole that you get to if you go as far down it as me is actually a guy called Helmut Krutz who is a German professor uh, of economics um, and uh, his work, The Money Zone Syndrome, is well worth a look at and that actually addresses the question of usury 
and uh, not just this idea of money creation, but the creation of money as debt at interest. Uh, and then, so that opens up a, a whole other discussion. Uh, for now, though, um, the Rummel uh, paper is very, very important. Um, and I was surprised not to be able to find uh, a reconstruction of it, so I did that similar to, I did one of um, Henry George's famous uh, speech, um, Peace by Standing Army, uh, which, which um, was a well-known speech of Henry George's, which there were no renditions of online, so I did one of those. Um, I didn't animate, I just put some nice photographs of uh, um, Beardsley Rummel, and hopefully this has been a useful um, presentation. Uh, just a couple of other um, things which I wanted to touch on. Let me just find them. I've been doing some research in ancient money. Uh, I think it's all this stuff about Islam. Right, where are we? Reality check. Um, right. um, Hi, my name is Graham. I'm going to put links to these in. This is an easy lesson on double entry bookkeeping just to get an idea of uh, how banks create money. Um, this here is a video about what is mo modern monetary theory. Um, but this one is actually in this world, nothing can be said to be very, certain very except good. death and taxes. Um, so this is by a gentleman called Robert Brown, um, and it, it really does um, give a good basis for modern money um, and compares, say, a country that doesn't have its own money, say, within the EU or the Euro area, um, and a country like Britain or Sweden, where I am, where uh, those two countries do create their own money and therefore have more options in terms of um, making sure that their own economy is healthy. Uh, so this is an excellent video for that and I'll put the description down in the thing. Macroeconomic um, effect which affects This is Steve Keen, uh, Modern Monetary Theory and the Law. Obviously there's international law and trade law, world trade organisation rules, all of that sort of thing which feeds into the ability of governments to um, actually act in the interests of those their citizens against the interests of the profits of corporations. Um, and uh, that is a dichotomy uh, which is resolved, I would claim, by corruption and by the fact that politicians act for corporations now, not citizens. Uh, which is something I would hope um, becomes clear in the forthcoming election and people will realise that uh, they really do need to get what I call the neoliberal elements out of politics and they're in all, all parties um, but uh, some of the parties are not actually led by neoliberals uh, like Labour, um, Green Party, uh, Plaid Cymru, Etc. I mean, do your own research. This is Things the David Graeber, knows, um, no one is the sexual balances um, video. Supposed to talk about, and he published a very, very good article in the Guardian. Again, I'll put a link in the description and in a blog. Um, at David wrote the excellent book Debt the First Five Thousand Years, um, which, if you want something to take on the beach on holiday, uh, that's um, not the sort of standard sort of. Uh, airport reading get the first 5,000 years highly recommended um, and uh, then we're back to there so that's where I'm coming from with that this this has taken the video well over an hour but and we are such as life hopefully um, it will prove of some interest to somebody